Well, I think we're ready to go. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's talk. Uh, I'm Mark Metcalf. I teach in the Department of East Asian Languages, Literatures, and Cultures. And today we are honored to have Professor Paul Golden from the East Asian Languages and Civilizations Department at the University of Pennsylvania. And he's going to be talking about, write the title down here, Self-Interest and Manipulation in Early Chinese Prose, Consequences of the Philosophical Marketplace. Uh, Professor Golden's research focuses on the cultural and intellectual history of early China, roughly from the Bronze Age to the fall of the Han Dynasty in AD 220. Other interests include gender and sexuality in Chinese history and the history of Chinese language. He is the author of Rituals of the Way, The Philosophy of Shunzi, 1999, The Culture of Sex in Ancient China, 2002, after Confucius Studies in Early Chinese Philosophy, 2005, and Confucianism, 2011. In addition, he has edited the revised edition of R.H. Van Gulick's classic study, Sexual Life in Ancient China, 2003, and has edited or co-edited six other books on Chinese culture and political philosophy. Please join me in welcoming Professor Golden. Thank you. This is my first time to the University of Virginia. It's also the first time that I'm giving this lecture. I don't know whether you've heard of the How to Read Chinese Poetry books uh, published by Columbia University Press, uh, edited by Tsai Zongxi. So now there is How to Read Chinese Prose, and Professor Tsai asked me whether I would like to participate in that. So I said, sure, okay. And he said, great, here's what you're working on. And he sent me an absolutely impossible topic, other philosophies. I said, you know, I, I might actually have to back out of this project. What do you mean by other philosophies? He says, oh, well, we have somebody doing Confucianism, and we have somebody doing Taoism, so why don't you do other? I said, well, I, I can't do other. Uh, he said, well, uh, I trust you to be able to carve out a coherent topic out of the following suggested readings. Actually, he suggested the very first one which we'll see is much more interesting. I would not have even thought of including this one. Um, so then I, I, I thought a little bit, and I did carve out a topic that I thought was coherent and fun, self-interest and manipulation in early Chinese prose. Um, and so when it came time to submit the paper, um, I submitted it with the title, Self-Interest and Manipulation in Early Chinese Prose, Consequences of the Philosophical Market, which said, no, it has to be other philosophies. I said, no, Zhongxi, I am not going to publish with you if my paper is called Other Philosophies. So he backed down, um, and the, 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 the copy editor has, has finished with it, so it is going to be self-interest and manipulation. Um, but the idea is to draw together some scrap of the Chinese prose that nobody else has already claimed, um, and see what they talk about. And it turns out, they talk about self-interest and manipulation, a lot. So, because this happens to be a, a chapter for a book, I have written, um, and, and normally I would try to do something extemporaneously, but I'm not going to pretend that I didn't already write. So I will read it, but I, I, I hope you'll agree that the material is engaging enough that uh, you, can, you can follow along even though I'll be reading. And then I have the passages that we're going to be looking at up on the screen, in English and in Chinese, in fact, almost exactly the way they're going to appear in the workbook, How to Read Chinese Prose. Readers sometimes wonder why China's first philosophical burgeoning took place during a singularly chaotic period, the aptly named Warring States. Would people really have taken a break from killing each other in order to engage in refined philosophical debate? The truth is that the people who were doing the refined philosophizing were not the people who were doing the killing. They were advising the people doing the killing, usually for a good salary. We may like to think of ancient Chinese philosophers as high-minded gentlemen rather than venal careerists, but even high-minded gentlemen need to eat, and the necessities of life were most readily obtained by serving a ruler who wished to profit from their expertise. The conventions of the Bronze Age, which had long held society together, were manifestly collapsing, and anyone with ideas about how to thrive in the, in the tumultuous new world was bound to get a hearing at court. 
philosophers chafed at being categorized with strategists, accountants, occasionally even jesters and jugglers. In short, anyone with specialized skills that might appeal to a lordly employer. But the records suggest that they were treated with exceptional deference, sometimes being addressed with honorific phrases that dukes and magnates would not have used with ordinary subjects. This makes sense if we think of, war of the warring states as a great philosophical marketplace. For rulers to attain a reputation for mistreating retainers would soon discover that no one wished to serve them, just as companies with low ratings on Glassdoor.com can have trouble finding employees, or instructors with poor student feedback scores have low course enrollments. And a ruler bereft of competent advisors soon became a ruler bereft of his throne. We know from Adam Smith that markets are driven by self-interest, and Warring States China was no different. Moreover, the most cunning participants in that market showed little compunction about manipulating gullible victims, especially rulers and others with enough clout to make the deception worthwhile. You wouldn't try to deceive some beggar, there wouldn't be anything to be, uh, to be gained from that. Thus, the themes of self-interest and manipulation frequently went hand in hand, and any account of early Chinese philosophical prose would be incomplete without attention to it. This brings us to our first item. Tang Zhu had an audience with Lord Chunshen, with which uh, Tsai Chung Chi recommended that I start with. And it's actually very interesting. It looks unbelievably boring, but it's not. Tang Zhu had an audience with Lord Chunshen is a brief item in a large and diverse anthology called Stratagems of the Warring States. Dr. This collection of ideologically indifferent anecdotes was compiled by Liu Xiang, who lived in the first century. A redactor who organized thousands of short bamboo texts in the palace library, as well as some private collections, producing many of the classical texts that survive to this day. Although Zhang Wotsa is sometimes characterized as a handbook of rhetoric, Liu's own preface discloses a different purpose, to preserve the deeds of lords and ministers who hatched ingenious plans in their struggle for survival. These stratagems, he says, are worth beholding, Kuguan even though they do not necessarily accord with mainstream morality. Tang Zhu had an audience with Lord Chunchen uh, might not seem noteworthy when taken out of context, but reading it against the known background reveals more layers than initially meets the eye. First, a complete translation. And I guess I'll read some of these word for word, some of the longer ones later, I'll just have on the screen for you to look at. Tang Zhu, who's that, footnote one, this name will be discussed below. <laughs> had an audience with that tells you that the name is significant, even though it looks meaningless. Had an audience with Lord Trunchen, uh, Trunchen, who, where he said, the men of Xi adorn themselves and cultivate their conduct in order to obtain lucrative employment. But I, your servant, would be ashamed to act like this and will not learn from them. I did not shirk from crossing the Yangtze and Yellow Rivers, traveling more than a, a thousand li in order to come here because I secretly admired your purpose, great lord and wish to abet your enterprise. What's his enterprise, I wonder? I have heard that the world would consider Ben and Zhu brave, even if they hid their blades in their breast. The world would deem sure of the West, beautiful, even if her clothes were shabby. Now, my lord, I don't know about my lord, but he's not English. Uh, you are the prime minister of the myriad chariot state of Chu. In defending the central states against turmoil, you have unfulfilled desires and attain unattained goals because your servitors' ranks are few. The owl is able to act because of the assistance of its pawns. It is clear that one owl is no match for five pawns. Now, my lord, why not become the owl of the world and let us, your servitors, be your pawns? We don't know too much about what's going on with the owl and the pawns, but it's clear that they are pieces in a game called uh, Liobo, and the owl is powerful and the pawns are not, but apparently the owl, even though it's powerful, needs the pawns uh, to work with him. On the surface, this is a straightforward example of a productive theme in early Chinese writing. A successful lord needs capable ministers. Tang Zhu, an obscure adventurer, has traveled all the way from the north to visit Lord Chunchen, prime minister of the great southern state of Chu. This is why he claims to have crossed both the Yellow and Yangtze rivers. Although my colleague has pointed out that the whole thing is a laughable anachronism, because in that day, the capital of Shu wouldn't have been as far south. Though whoever wrote this must not have known the geography very well, and it's a very 
you know, poor excuse of, yes, it's literature, it's okay. It's fake, but it's fun. Anyway, that's why he traveled across the two rivers, because whoever forged this story or wrote it hundreds of years later didn't remember where the capital was. Um, it's as though, you know, saying, I came all the way down to Washington to meet you in the capital at a moment in American history when the capital was still Philadelphia. That, that, it's that kind of error. Lord Trisham is sometimes known as one of the four princes of the warring states, John was the ones, uh, because he was famous for recruiting talented retainers. We do not know whether Tung Chu's effort was successful because Lord Trisham's response is not recorded. That in itself is telling, for if Tung Chu were as talented as he suggests, we should already know of him as one of Lord Trisham's followers, but since we do not, we must suspect that he was a charlatan. A review of other references to Tangju, as well as the meaning of his name, adds to the reader's doubts. A different anecdote in Zhang Guatsa, Tangju is employed by the Prime Minister of Qin to bribe potential enemies in Zhang. In another, he appears to be in the service of Wei, for he beseeches the King of Qin to assist that beleaguered state. And in the most famous story, he threatens to assassinate the King of Qin, the future First Emperor, who has been bullying the Lord of Anling, a paltry principality. That's like, you know, the lord of some suburb of Philadelphia. As all of these stories are said in the 3rd century BCE, it is conceivable that they refer to the same person. But he would have to be interpreted as a faithless agent for different kingdoms at different times. Now working for Qin, now working against him. The Chinese scholar Huang Xingguang has argued that Tang Chu was not a real person. And the name was simply invented for its meaning exaggerated proposals, a fine epithet for a cousiner. If Huang is right, the consequence is that whenever we encounter a character named Tang Ju, we must not trust anything that comes out of his mouth. To use a deprecating term that we shall see later, Tang Ju was a yo shui, an itinerant persuader. Some information about Lord Chuan sheds even further light. As mentioned above, he's best known today for his followers one of whom was at least as famous as he was, Xun Guang, variously known as Xunzi, Master Xun, and Sun Jingzi, Master Chamberlain Sun. Xunzi is now considered one of China's greatest philosophers. Even in his own day, he was known as the most revered of teachers. Zui Wei Lao Xu. Consequently, Tang Ju's assertion that Lord Chunshan has failed to achieve his ambitions because his servitors are few. I don't know whether you can see. Uh, has to be interpreted as an oblique indictment of Shunzi's competence. Just imagine Merlin's reaction if some parvenu announced to King Arthur that he lacked satisfactory advisors. Thus, Tang Ju had an audience with Lord Chunshin must be read in conjunction with a nearby story in John Wutsa, which relates how an unnamed client, he's just called Ka, persuaded Lord Chunshin to dismiss Shunzi. Lord Chunshin immediately regrets heeding this advice. But when he tries to recall Shunzi, the latter sends him a bold letter that begins with the sentence, the leper pities the king, because no one tries to assassinate the leper. Since Lord Trunchen was in fact assassinated in 238, any ancient reader would have understood Shunzi's words as a sage premonition. Indeed, a discerning reader has to suspect that the unidentified retainer responsible for ousting Shunzi was none other than Tangju. And if that was the case, Tanju might best be understood as an agent sent by an enemy who perceived that the first step toward assassinating Lord Chunchen was to remove the wise Xunzi from his side. What better method than to trick Lord Chunchen into dismissing Xunzi himself? Kui Mono, that's not Chinese, that's Latin. Who stood to gain? Lord Chunchen's assassin was named Li Yuan. He was another one of Lord Chunchen's retainers and, like Xunzi, an expatriate from Zha. With Lord Chunchen out of the way, Li Yuan went on to become prime minister, and his nephews actually ascended the throne as Kings Yo and I of Chu. Much of this is related elsewhere in Zhang Guatsa. Li Yuan himself and his whole family perished just ten years later at the hands of yet another assassin who went on to become Fu Chu. That was the last one. Soon Fu Chu himself was killed when Qin conquered Chu. It was a violent age. How much of this is true? That is precisely the wrong question. 
Readers of Zhang Bozha certainly knew that Lord Chunchen was assassinated soon after he dismissed Xunzi. This much was common knowledge. If Huang Xinguang is right that Tang Zhu is an invented name, then the anecdote has to be interpreted as a fictitious but instructive story relating to these momentous events. What is more important than the veracity of the tale is its moral. Do not heed the unsolicited counsel of people whom you do not know and cannot trust, especially if you are a juicy target. They might have unpleasant plans for you. The next piece, I don't remember whether it's Sai Zong Shi chose this one, or I think I chose it. Um, it's an example of all the faithlessness and bad faith in bargaining. Chuan Yukuan and the vertical and horizontal alliances in a miscellany called Wu Shu Chun A commonplace illustrating the untrustworthiness of such itinerant persuaders is their advocacy of the so-called vertical and horizontal alliances. By the middle of the 3rd century BCE, it was apparent to all observers that the state of Qin was at least as powerful as all the others combined. Accordingly, representatives of Qin's chief rivals attempted to unite under a vertical alliance, but Qin's counselors shrewdly recruited desperate states to its own league, known as the Horizontal Alliance. It is difficult to say more than this, because almost all relevant information comes from literary sources that focus on the rhetorical strategies employed by self-interested speakers at court, rather than the practical details of how the alliances were negotiated, sustained, and evoked. For diplomatic historians, the sources are frustratingly incomplete. In philosophical and anecdotal literature, the stance toward these alliances is usually disparaging, as in the following anecdote from Twincho, Springs and Autumns of Mr. Liu, an encyclopedic text compiled under the auspices of Liu Bu Wei, a former chief minister of Qin and renowned patron like Lord Twincho. Among the men of Qi, there was one Chun Yukun who persuaded the King of Wei to join the Vertical Alliance. The King of Wei, finding him cogent, furnished him with ten chariots and was about to dispatch him as an ambassador to Chu. As he was taking his leave, he persuaded the king of Egypt to join the horizontal alliance, whereupon the king of Wei called off the entire expedition. He failed not only in his intention of having the king join the vertical alliance, but also in the matter of having the king join the horizontal alliance. Too much ability is worse than too little ability. An abundance of cogency is worse than a lack of it. it reminds me of a joke you can ask me during the Q&A. Joe Cauldrons depicts Trey gnawing on his finger. By this means, the former kings demonstrated that great skill should not be practiced. <coughs> By referring to Trey, the venerable artisan who would rather bite his finger than allow it to mar his work, the anecdote makes use of another early commonplace. Too much of a good thing can undo one's entire achievement. One of the most famous examples is the adding feet to the snake story in Zhang Guanzha. During a contest to see who can draw a snake the fastest, the presumptive winner starts to show off by adding feet to his snake while he waits for the others to finish, thereby ruining it and losing his prize, because a, feet with sna a snake with feet is no longer a snake at all. In the same vein, Chun Yukun should be content with his reward of ten chariots and a royal commission, but loses everything because he cannot resist the urge to display his silver tongue. The very first word, Qi, warns readers that the commonplace of the itinerant persuader is at work as well. The locus is the court of Wei, but Trinya is not from Wei. He is an adventurer from Qi who has come to Wei in order to parlay his forensic skills into wealth and status. One can only surmise that Trinya must have worn out his welcome in his home state if he was now trying his luck in Wei. In another section of Zhang Wenzha, for example, he's accused of taking bribes to dissuade the king of Qi from attacking Wei. Perhaps such chicanery led to his expulsion. At any rate, in the present story, the King of Wei is initially foolish enough to, su to suppose that Chunyu's support for the Vertical Alliance is sincere. But as soon as he grasps, as soon as he shows that he can just as easily argue for the Horizontal Alliance, the King grasps that he cannot be trusted. <coughs> the theme of the self-interested and unscrupulous minister, whose attempts at persuasion must be resisted, is a major focus of Han Fei's 
a collection of essays attributed to the brilliant writer and political philosopher Han Fei, who died in 233. No one diagnosed more insightfully the interplay with conflicting interests at court. Ironically, he succumbed to the same forces that he described so memorably in his writings. He was imprisoned on trumped-up charges and then talked into committing suicide by his main rival, Lisa. In the following excerpt from Wudu, The Five Kinds of Vermin, Hanfei explains how rulers go astray by failing to recognize that ministers make proposals to further their own interests, not those of the sovereign. This is a long one, so I won't read it in its entirety, although I'll be glad to come back to it if anyone has questions about it. The first paragraph says basically when ministers argue for joining the vertical alliance or the horizontal alliance, they have some private motive. They're not arguing in the best interests of the state which they nominally serve. If they ask you to join the horizontal alliance, that means you constantly have to work uh, on behalf of the great state, and everybody at that time knows that the great state is Qin. You wear yourself out, you, um, you uh, uh, exhaust your resources for the benefit of a greater state, and you don't know that you'll get any benefit out of it. Um, if you join the vertical alliance, you will be rescuing desperate states that are in danger of being steamrolled by Qin, and it's the same problem, you'll exhaust your own resources without necessarily um, gaining any benefit from it. In fact, all you're going to do is make yourself a hated enemy of Qin, which is much stronger than you. Then the conclusion, um, right, he recapitulates, when ministers make these proposals, it's because of their own interest, not because it's really in your interest as a ruler to, to follow what they're, uh, uh, what they're suggesting. They'll, they'll figure out a way to enrich themselves, and then they'll withdraw from the scene you know, just before disaster strikes. Then the final uh, paragraph is important enough we can read the whole thing. Why then do the doomed rulers of broken states listen to the fanciful persuasions of speechifiers? In other words, I've given you this whole litany of explanations why the proposals of these ministers are un, untru, I mean, un, unreliable because the ministers themselves are merely furthering their own self-interest. It's because such rulers are not clear-sighted about profit for Gong and Si. These terms will be discussed below. They do not investigate whether ministers' words are suitable and do not necessarily punish them for disappointing outcomes. The key to understanding this very long passage comes toward the end in the references to Gomen's. So is the easier of the two terms to translate, it means private, especially in the sense of private interest, or judgments reached by private criteria. Ministers who make proposals always do so out of uh, an expectation of some private benefit. This paragraph is very clear about that. Gong is derived from the old word meaning patriarch or duke. In Hanfei's time, it had come to refer more broadly to the interests of the ruler. In modern writing, Gong is often translated as public, but this is misleading, as there was nothing like our concept of the public interest in ancient China. Thus a phrase like Gong Yongche means vehicle for public use in modern Chinese, but would have meant vehicle for the exclusive use of the duke in the classical language. In, in ancient China, if you use the Gong Yongcha, that's the last ride you will ever take, because the next one will be the ride to the execution ground. Many scholars interpret Gong as something like the general interests of the state as opposed to the private interests of its ministers. Although this might be defensible for other early Chinese texts, it is still questionable in the context of Han Feizi, which acknowledges that the Interests of a particular ruler, or even long-term prudential interests, are not necessarily identical to those of the abstract state. Earlier in the same chapter, Gong is defined straightforwardly as that which opposes Si. In Han Feizi, rulers are trusted, rulers are counseled not to trust anyone, not even their kin and bedfellows. But ministers are regarded as the party most likely to cause harm because they are indispensable. By Hanfei's time, states were already so large that a ruler could not hope to oversee the administration personally. But relying on ministers is dangerous because they act in their own interest. That's 
not out of not that of their employer, and certainly not that of the kingdom they represent, which would be gold. Rulers who fail to distinguish between gold and silver, when they hear ministers' proposals, will inevitably come to grief. The passage above illustrates this tension through the example of the horizontal and vertical alliances. The addressee of this chapter is evidently the ruler of a state other than Qin, for he is advised to join neither party for two important reasons. The obligations will only weaken him, and the alliances are promoted by ministers with ulterior motives. The text does not specify the right strategy. A ruler worth his salt will have to analyze that for himself. But its advice is very similar to that of Tang Zhu had an audience with Lord Chunshan. Do not blindly follow your minister's proposals because you cannot be sure of their designs. Above all, be aware that your demise may be all too convenient for them. A passage in a different chapter, Zhu Da, the way of the ruler, illustrates a related point. In the face of all this duplicity, the ruler ought not to reveal his inner thoughts or even try to outwit his underlings by dissembling, for dissembling too can be detected. Instead, he should present a blank poker face to the outside world, leaving his enemies with, without any toehold whatsoever. Thus it is said, the Lord ought not to make his desires apparent. If the Lord's desires are apparent, the ministers will carve and polish themselves to his liking. The Lord ought not to make his intentions apparent. If the Lord's intentions are apparent, the ministers will display themselves falsely. Thus it is said, eliminate likes, eliminate dislikes. Then the ministers will appear plainly. Eliminate tradition, eliminate wisdom. Then the ministers will prepare themselves. The ruler must eliminate wisdom because the wisest policy of all is to come across as a blockhead, all the while carefully observing and assessing everyone else. Such phrases evoke Laozi, and I give a little reference internally to the Taoism chapter, um, because I wasn't allowed to write about Taoism. Although they are not direct quotes, at least not to any known edition of that text. Han Feita contains many such allusions, including two chapters of disputed authorship, offering direct interpretations of Laozi from the perspective of statecraft. Whereas Han Fei was a real person and may have been the author of at least some chapters in Han Fei's of the military strategist Sun Wu is a less credible figure for several reasons. First, his given name, Warlike, seems too good to be true. It's as though, you know, um, who's the guy who, the, the great step for mankind? Um, Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong. It's as though his name were like Explorer or Moonwalk Armstrong. Um, or, I don't know. It's as though George Washington's given name were Liberator Washington. This guy's name is Warlock Swin. Uh, Warlike, not Warlock, sorry. Uh, <laughs> that would be cute, too. Second, the only biographical information about him is a patently romanticized story in Shu Ji, records of a historian, that relates how he trained the harem of King Hanu of Wu to become a fearsome battalion. Third, and most important, the tax of Sun Tzu bears hallmarks of a period much later than the turn of the 6th century BCE, when he must have been active if he really served King Malu. Consequently, we must treat it as an anonymous work that was proleptically attributed to a legendary figure of the past. This was a common practice at the time. Another example is Guanzi, a collection attributed to Guanzhou, who died in 645 BC and probably did not write a single word of it. The following excerpt from the Mogong Attacking Strategically chapter of Suiza stresses that warfare is a matter of rational self-interest rather than valor or bloodlust. Since the fundamental purpose of a military campaign is to increase the state's power, a commander must weigh the strategies that do and do not produce tangible results. Capturing a state intact is always best. Destroying it is inferior. Capturing an army intact is best. Destroying it is inferior. Capturing a, capturing a battalion intact is best. Destroying it is inferior. Capturing a company intact is best. Capturing a squad intact is best. For this reason, one who attains 100 victories in 100 battles is not the most adept of the adept. One who subdues the enemy's troops without a battle 
is the most adept of the adept. Thus, the best military strategy is to attack the enemy strategy. Next comes attacking his alliances. Next comes attacking his troops. Last comes attacking cities. The method of attacking cities is to do so only when there's no alternative. Armored siege vehicles and other machinery take three months to complete. The earthworks take another three months to finish. If the commander cannot overcome his frustration and has his troops climb the wall like ants, one in three of his warriors will be killed, and the city still not seized. I don't think I need to be. And the city still not be seized. And the city still not seized. Reminds me of a joke about Oscar Wilde. They asked him what he did all day. He said, I spent the morning putting in a comma, and I spent the afternoon taking it back out. Uh, this would be a disastrous attack. Thus, one who is adept at using troops subdues the enemy's troops, but not through battle. He seizes the enemy cities, but not by attacking. He annihilates the enemy state, but not through protracted campaigns. One's goal must be to contend with the rest of the world by capturing enemy targets intact. Thereby, one's troops will not be depleted, but one's gains can be kept intact. This is the method of attacking strategically. Uh, we can stop there for now. Whereas contemporary literature Delighted in the exploits of legendary or semi-legendary heroes like the aforementioned Mungba in this guy. Ben. His name is Ben. He's a great warrior. Warrior Ben. Anyway, whereas contemporary literature delighted in the exploit, exploits of heroes like Ben, Swinza reminds its reader, who is evidently envisioned as a lord, or strategist with national interests to consider, that although military glory may, may inspire enconiasts, it does not necessarily benefit the state. Protracted campaigns, in particular, are unlikely to yield enough spoils to compensate for draining the state's coffers. Thus, the best battlefield strategy is often the one that avoids confrontation on the battlefield. Decisive action, especially when attack, attacking cities, is inadvisable unless there is no alternative. As in Confeza, one of the best techniques is to manipulate the enemy into committing first. Make the enemy formulate a strategy so as to calculate his strengths and weaknesses. Make him act so as to know the pattern of his movement and stillness. Make him assume a form so as to know whether his territory will mean life or death for him. Probe him so as to know the points where he has excess and deficiency. Thus, the supreme object in forming one's troops is to be without form. If we are without form, then even those under deep cover will not be able to spy us out, and those who are wise will not be able to plan for us. By adjusting to forms, one provides victories for one's army, but the army is unable to know this. Everyone will know the form that we use for victory, but no one will know the form that we use to determine victory. Thus, when we are victorious in battle, we do not repeat ourselves but respond to forms inexhaustibly. Because you can't use the strategy that you use to win battle A in battle B because the situation in battle B is not going to be the same as the situation that prompted your strategy in battle A. Formlessness, wishing. Another term that resonates with the philosophy of Lanza and allied traditions is a byword for avoiding any type of committed formation until the enemy has already disclosed his intentions. It is the enemy who determines how he is to be destroyed. For every situation and for every enemy tactic, a shrewd commander will know the appropriate response. In games like curling and bocce similarly, Whoever throws last ball to win. I didn't know this about curling until I started watching it at the Sochi Olympics. That's the one that Whoever goes last is supposed to win. In fact, if you go last and don't win, it's, it's like a tremendous embarrassment in the game of curling because you have the big advantage of knowing what they did first. But the strategy by which one attains victory can never be reused because never again will precisely the same situation obtain. The allusions to and evocations of Lao are too pervasive to be accidental. The opening of Lanza 68 must have been written by someone familiar with these military traditions. One who is adept at using warriors does not fight. One who is adept at battle does not rage. One who is adept at defeating the enemy does not engage. Not all voices 
were pleased to see the pursuit of self-interest elevated to an art form. And the annexation of weaker kingdoms, which is presumed in Sunza to be the very purpose of warfare, elsewhere elicited dismay. Nor did Confucians, and here I have an internal cross-reference to chapter 2, because I was not allowed to write about Confucians, have a monopoly on moralizing critique. In a famous passage in Mortha, we never thought of having a chapter on Mortha, so I'm allowed to write about Mortha. In a famous passage in Mortha, conquerors are compared to criminals such as thieves, kidnappers, and murderers, whereas everyone agrees that the latter should be punished forthwith, Bellicose kings who shamelessly declare themselves righteous eat merely because they despoil uh, neighboring countries rather than their own. Morta is a collection of essays, anecdotes, logical exercises, and treatises on defensive warfare that seems to have served as a school text. Clearly, it is not the work of its putative author, Morty, who died in 390 approximately, because the text often quotes him as though he were a long dead authority. Morty may have been a real person and may have established a functioning school where documents like the received Morta were used in instruction. Morta is notoriously repetitive. So I'm not going to read the whole thing, enough to give you a flavor. Uh, and the following selection from Tian Zhi Xia, uh, Xia, The Will of Heaven, Part C, is no exception. But the concrete examples are nevertheless effectively deployed to convey the a fortiori nature of the argument. If filching a neighbor's melons and ginger warrants punishment, how much more so does destroying a kingdom? Suppose there is someone who enters other people's gardens and takes their peaches, plums, melons, and ginger. I love how concrete it is. If his superiors apprehend him, they will punish him. If the multitudes hear of his conduct, they will decry him. Why? One would say it was because, it was because he reaps the fruit without engaging in the labor and took what was not his. By the way, that's a very often frequently quoted passage because it's, it's actually not that common to hear a classical Chinese explanation of what's wrong with theft. And here Moza comes out and says that you're reaping the fruit without having contributed the labor. Which is an interesting take on what's wrong with that. Anyway, how much more does this apply to one who climbs over other people's walls and kidnaps their sons and daughters? Or one who drills, I mean, just for the sheer familiarity with the deaths of skullduggery, this is an amusing passage. Whoever wrote this must have heard of such cases. One who drills into other people's treasuries and steals their gold gems or silk fibers. We don't know what's going on with the silk fibers because the text is not in great shape, but obviously it refers to valuable textiles of some kind. Or one who climbs into other people's fence ranches and steals their oxen and horses. How much more does this apply to one who kills an innocent person? In the government of today, kings, lords, and grandees uh, one who kills an innocent person, climbs over other people's walls and kidnaps their son and daughter, drills into other people's treasure. I told you, it's repetitive, right? They get punished, just as they would have been punished under Yao Shuan Yu Tang King or Even under the Sage Kings, they were punished. But when the territorial lords of today all invade, attack, and conquer one another, this is tens of millions of times worse than killing an innocent person. You know, there's something to the, the arithmetic. It is tens of millions of times worse than climbing over other people's walls and kidnapping their sons and daughters, or boring into other people's treasuries and stealing their gold gems and silk fibers. It is tens of millions of times worse than climbing into other people's fence ranches and stealing their oxen and horses, or entering other people's gardens and taking their beaches, palms, balance, and ginger. Yet they all call him righteous, call themselves righteous. Two crimes. One is the crime. The second is to call yourself righteous in the midst of committing the crimes. I mean, how shameless. Thus, Master Morza said, this is obscuring righteousness. Master Morza cares about righteousness. How is it different from obscuring the difference between black and white? or sweet and bitter. Suppose there is someone who, having been shown a bit of black, calls it black, but having been shown a lot of black, calls it white. He would have to say, my eyes are defective. I cannot tell the difference between black and white. Suppose there is someone who, having tasted a bit of something sweet, calls it sweet, but having tasted a lot of it, calls it bitter. He would have to say, my mouth is defective. I cannot tell whether something tastes sweet or bitter. In the government of today's kings, lords, and grandees, Killing people within the state is prohibited by means of the executioner's axe, but one who's able to kill many people in neighboring states is for that reason. That's so, so crucial. 
um, deemed praiseworthy and righteous. How is this, right? For that very reason. How is this different from obscuring the difference between black and white, or sweet and bitter? The complaint is reminiscent of Augustine's observation that a predator who plies the seas with one vessel is called a pirate, while one who does so with a whole fleet is called an emperor. But because they had few useful recommendations to offer with the emperors, Moists fell out of favor. Eventually, the whole philosophy became a relic. The philosophical marketplace was a marketplace after all. False virtue, true rewards. Another story about Chuyu Quinn exemplifies a final commonplace to be discussed here. As men of service, that's my translation of shirt, became known as a greedy and mendacious lot, feigning extraordinary honesty, emerged as yet another profitable strategy. In the past, that's almost like once upon a time, the king of Qi sent Chun Yuquan to offer a crane to the king of Chu. He set off through the gates of the city, and as he was on the road, the crane flew away. What was it that Bobby Bowden always said? Daddy, come it. Um, anyway, bearing only an empty cage, he invented a fraudulent excuse. So there's no gray area. He invented a fraudulent excuse. When he went to his audience with the King of Chu, he said, The King of Chi sent me to offer you a crane. But as I was crossing the river, the crane's thirst was too much for me to bear. When I let it out so that it could drink, it left me and flew away. I wish to die by stabbing myself in the gut or hanging myself by the neck, but I was afraid that people would criticize my king for making his man of service kill himself for the sake of a bird. A crane is a feathered creature. There are many other animals of the same type. I wish to buy one in place of the missing crane, but this would have been untrustworthy and deceptive toward my king. I wish to flee to another kingdom, but it pained me that this would cause a breach between the two rulers. Thus I have come here to admit my transgression, kowtowing, I shall accept your punishment, great king. The king of Chu said, It is very good that the king of Qi has such trustworthy men of service. He rewarded Chun Yu generously, with riches worth several times more than if the crane had still been with him. This vignette appears in Shi Qi. And I have a little internal cross-reference to Shirji because I was not allowed to write about Shirji. Shirji is not over philosophies. <laughs> I was given scraps, and I produced the best chapter in the whole book. Anyway, um, <laughs> I was given what everybody else left behind. I'll take confusionism, thank you. I'll take thousands. Ooh, ooh, I want Shirji. Hey. Professor Golden, would you like to contribute to our book? We have other philosophy. <laughs> Where were I? This vignette appears in Shuji, chapter 5. Mine's chapter 4. But was probably inserted by Chu Shaoswen, a scholar who has been criticized for having dared to add his words to Sima Chen's masterpiece. Regardless of its origin, the literary effect of this piece lies in its modulation of prior tales. It's a very interesting paper on this by Giulia Bacini. The theme of the crane lost on the road, turns out, is attested in a variety of early Chinese sources. But in earlier versions, the hapless emissary is someone other than Chun Yuquin. Moreover, he is spared because he confesses sincerely. Good things come to those who freely admit their guilt. The present text, however, reconfigures the dynamics by inserting the shifty Chun Yuquin as the protagonist and having the narrator state explicitly that he invented a fraudulent excuse. There can't be any doubt about this, right? He invented a fraudulent excuse. Now the moral is very different. Do not be a dupe like the king of Chu. It is very good. Who not only rewards Chun Yu richly, but also pronounces him trustworthy, seeming precisely what a man of service should be, and the very opposite of what he is. In later centuries, such themes were expanded into what Alan J. Berkowitz has called reclusion as a ruse, conspicuously declining offers of employment in order to raise one's market value. 
A modern analog would be the maxim that one should never accept the first offer that comes one's way. The more such men pretended not to be motivated by rank and salary, the more mercenary they really were. Even Confucius is said to have held out for the right price. That's Analect 913. To be sure, he is usually thought to have meant this metaphorically, but not all men of service were so pure and incorrupt. Thank you.